I wasn't sure if I should preach this. And at the end, you could tell me if it was a good idea. <laughs> um, I believe that for most men, the key to their future is fixing their past. Okay? And I believe that for most men, the most, I would say actually for all men, I'll make a stronger statement. For all men, the strongest per person in their life is their father. Now, some of you would say, my dad wasn't a big deal. I didn't even know him. The empty chair at your dinner table was the dominating force in your childhood. Um, our fathers shape us into who we become. So we have this little adage, like father, like son. If, if, if your dad loves the Lord, that's good. If your dad doesn't love the Lord, is that a curse over you? Um, I'll start with a, a story. I, I, I've been a mixed martial arts fan since the old pride fighting days and the early UFC days. I don't, uh, I don't fight because look at me. But, uh, <laughs> but I like watching other guys fight, especially while I eat chicken wings. And I prayed about it and I felt led, so don't judge me. But I, I, I like watching MMA and... Uh, Early on, in the early days of the UFC, there was a fighter named Jens Pulver, okay? Jens Pulver, his nickname was Little Evil. He was a little guy, but he had a left hand and he was violent. And I'll never forget, I was watching one of his fights. He knocked the guy out cold. They went to you know, interview him. I think maybe put a belt around him. He did win the lightweight championship at one point in the UFC. And on camera, I'll never forget what he said. He looked at the camera and he says, see dad, I did amount to something. I thought that poor guy's been fighting his dad every day. He puts his dad's face on the opponent and knocks that guy out cold. Jens Pulver later became a Christian and he wrote a book telling his testimony. And what he said was that his dad was such an evil man that he can remember one time as a little boy, I think he might've been around nine years of age, his dad put a loaded gun in his mouth and said, uh, son, do you know why I'm not gonna pull the trigger? He's like, no, dad, because you're not worth a bullet. There are seven, or excuse me, five kinds of dads. There's the tragic. There's the tragic no dad. Meaning your dad wasn't there, not because he didn't love you, but because something tragic happened. Your dad died. He got cancer, he was in the hospital. He, something cataclysmic happened, so he wasn't there, it was tragic. How many of you, your dad was a tragic dad? It was tragic, what happened? You have a heart for your dad, you're like, what happened? He wasn't in my life like he should have been, but it wasn't because he didn't care, it's because circumstances prevented. A lot of you are soldiers and you know exactly what this is like. My dad died, he loved me, it was tragic. Some dads are terrible and they, they will leave they just run out on mom, get her pregnant, have nothing to do with her. Abandon the kids. They're just terrible dads. They're, they're not helpful, they're not present, they're not generous. I don't wanna make you bitter, but I do wanna be honest. How many of you, your dad was a terrible dad? You're like, he's just a terrible dad. Thirdly, some dads are tough. These are the alphas, these are the lions. They're domineering, they're overbearing, they're always pushing their sons towards sports. God forbid if you're the non-jock kid with that dad, he's like, play football and wrestle. You're like, I am skinny and terrified. So I was playing the piano and found my love language, you know, and, but the dad has to push domineering, overbearing. He's the dad who's on the sideline screaming. Have you been to a Little League game? A Little League game is the surest way to find the least secure men in the community because they are yelling at 10 year olds, right? <laughs> Suck it up, you can do better. I'm like, he still has a sippy cup. Just <laughs> dial it back, all right? Tough dad, how many of you had tough dad? Tough dad, 
tough dad. And your, your tough dad says stuff like this. You know why I was hard on you? Because I love you. You're like, well, then why didn't we get ice cream? That could have also been an alternative. <laughs> the tender dad, this is the lamb. Sweet, kind, nice, but weak, passive, doesn't make plans, gets run over. Everybody likes him, nobody respects him. Oh, your dad was such a nice guy. Did you respect him? Uh, he was such a nice guy. How many of you, your dad was the tender dad? He was a sweetheart. And then there's the terrific dad, number five. This is not a perfect dad, because there isn't one, but it's a godly dad. He loved you. He was emotionally present. He loved the Lord. He stayed faithful to your, to your mom. He bought you a Bible, right? He prayed to Jesus with you. It wasn't perfect, but it's pretty terrific. How many of you had a terrific dad? Okay, that's, that's a high percentage, by the way. In the Old Testament, and this is gonna be more of a conversation than a lecture, there's 400 years of silence before Jesus comes and there's an Old Testament prophet named Malachi. And he says that there are two kinds of cultures. This can be your nation, this can also be your family. Malachi 4, 6, here's the end of the Old Testament. His, that's Jesus, rural, homeschooled, redneck cousin John, right? I'm, I'm assuming you guys have rednecks here. You have, you have kids that live out in the woods and only eat what they can kill. Um, some of you are like, isn't that everybody? No, it's not. Um, <laughs> John, he was the homeschooled kid out on the farm with his parents and it says that he only ate bugs and honey. You're a weird kid if you're like, yeah, bugs and sugar, that's what I grew up on. And, uh, and he wore a Jedi robe. So he's quite a personality. His John's preaching will turn the hearts of the what? The fathers to their Who's coming? Jesus. Why is he coming? To take men's hearts and turn them toward their children. Only Jesus can really do this. Um, do you know what the leading cause of death in the world is this year? It's abortion. Those are guys that don't wanna be dads, but they do wanna have sex. They don't have hearts toward their children. God can forgive that, but we have a whole culture that the father's hearts are not toward the children. And the hearts of the children, he says to their fathers, but whose heart goes first? The father's heart is supposed to go to the child. That opens the child's heart so that they also have a heart for the father. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a what? America's cursed. How do I know? Look at the hearts of the fathers. Look at the hearts of the fathers. Today, the majority of kids born to women 30 and under are born out of wedlock without a father. What that means is the norm today is not to have a dad. Is it any wonder we have gender confusion, gender identity crisis, sexual confusion? People don't even know a healthy man. Men are waiting until their early 30s to marry. It's the longest in history and in the middle they're dating, relating and fornicating. The number one consumer of pornography is 12 to 17 year old boys. Which means if a boy starts actively looking at porn at 12 and he is statistically gonna marry at 30, 31 or 32, that's 20 years of porn and girlfriends and then we wonder why that marriage isn't healthy. The least likely person to go to college is a male, not a female. The least likely person to go to church is a male, not a female. And now in our nation, it is less likely for a male to have a driver's license than a female. Guys are so living off the backs of their mothers 
and being irresponsible that they're not even getting driver's licenses. How does all of this happen? It's a cursed culture. You need to know that America is a cursed culture. How do you reverse the curse? God is your father, changes your heart, gives you a heart for your child, gives your child a new heart, a heart for you and a heart for him. It all starts in the hearts of men. You walk into church and you don't see men. 60% of church attenders are female, not male. There's between 11 and 13 million more women than men in church. And I say, that's great. I'm, I'm glad that the ladies love Jesus, but it would be nice if their husbands, fathers, brothers, cousins did as well. Here's one of the, for you older men, here's one of the great verses. First Corinthians 4, 15. Though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many. It's hard to find a father, isn't it? It's hard to find a father, a spiritual father. One of the blessings of the church of Jesus Christ is if you had a good dad, you're blessed, and you might meet some other guys that also add value. So now you're doubly blessed. But if you didn't have a good dad in your family, you might find a good guy in the church family and he could be like a spiritual father. How many of you have somebody you say, I look at them like a spiritual father. They didn't birth me, but since my new birth, they've helped raise me. And that's why we're here. Some of you older guys, you'll feel disqualified. You'll be like, I can't be the mentor. I screwed it up. Then be the repentant mentor. Say, I, I did this wrong and I want to teach you so that you can do it right. One of the things that you have to do as a parent, as a father and or a spiritual father is let them learn through your error. I tell my kids all the time, I was sleeping with your mom before I was saved and we were dating and that was wrong. And it, it caused pain and difficulty in our early years of marriage because my wife knew it was wrong. She was a pastor's daughter. So when we were together, she would feel guilt and shame. And then I got saved. I'll never forget, I'll tell you the story. Um, I, w- I got saved, I went to church and the, the pastor preached against fornication. And I was like, that's an F word I never heard growing up <laughs> next to the airport. So I called the pastor and uh, I said, uh, yeah, that was a really good lecture on fornication. And I just had a few questions. Okay? And I said, uh, it sounds like, I'm sure I heard it wrong, you're not supposed to sleep with somebody you're not married to. He's like, yeah, that's what it means. I was like, dope. I was like, well, if you're already sleeping together, it's, I mean, it's too late. It's like running a red light. It's dangerous to back up, right? Like, um, <laughs> He's like, no, you gotta stop. I said, all at once? He's like, yeah. He said, who's this for? I said, oh, it, it's for a friend. <laughs> so then I called Grace and I was like, hey friend, I just talked to the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been fornicating. And she says, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. I said, well, he said, we need to stop fornicating. She's like, okay. I was like, this is not going the way I was hoping. <laughs> But I thought, hey, we'll get married and you know, we'll just hit pause on the VCR for you old guys, you know what I'm talking about, you young guys. We used to watch movies on the VCR and we would pick them up at a video store that we would drive to on a dinosaur. So we get on our dinosaur and we go to the store and we get a cassette and we come home and put it home. So I thought, I'll just hit pause on the VCR and we'll pick up where we left off, we didn't. Because my wife associated being with me and feeling shame. I've been honest about this with my kids. I want you to do better than your dad did, okay? Some of you, you were, you were born on the one yard line. You got it to the 50 yard line. You want your kids to get it to the red zone. You want your grandkids to get it into the end zone. The goal of a father should always be more and better for my kids than me. 
I want them to have my ceiling be their floor and build on that. You do not have many fathers, he says, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Part of this is looking for men who are good, godly husbands and fathers, and even if they have gotten it wrong, God has made it right because God gives new beginnings. In addition, what happens when men don't have fathers, they don't know how to become men. A boy can't raise himself. He needs a father. And if he doesn't get a father, he needs a spiritual father. And if he doesn't get a spiritual father, he's got a crisis. How many of you are raising boys? Okay. Does it take more faith to raise a boy than a girl? It totally does. A girl's born, she's like pretend cooking and tucking a baby in. You're like, there's a future. You go over to your boy, you're like, oh my gosh, we're two people back on the evolutionary chart. This kid's eating his own turds, you know? Not my family, just one I know about. So, <laughs> it takes faith to raise a boy and it takes a man to raise a man. So, here's what we have. I'll give you two verses. Something in our culture that I will call the father wound. John 14, 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. If you have a father wound, you have an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit is, I'm on my own, nobody cares, help is not on the way, I'm abandoned. That's the orphan heart. Paul says to the Galatians that we have received adoption as sons. What this means is that as a Christian man, God is now your father and he's adopted you into his family. This breaks generational curses in family lines. And the first thing that your heavenly father will want to teach you is how to forgive your earthly father. Every one of our fathers had faults, flaws, and failures. Some of you are really good dads, but you know where you've fallen short. It doesn't matter how great your dad was, you still have things you need to forgive. Forgiving your earthly father warms, opens up, transforms your relationship with your heavenly father and teaches you how to be a good son and grows you up as a man. And here's what I'm saying, your view of God, this will be a little controversial, your view of God is largely a projection or a rejection of your earthly father. Prove it to you. Um, Atheism says, I have no dad. Agnosticism says, I have a dad, but I don't know him and I don't care to meet him. Uh, deism says, I have a dad, but he lives far away. He's non-relational, he's not involved in my life. Calvinism says, I have a dad, but he's a little domineering, overbearing, and sometimes gets angry. Arminianism says, my dad kind of lets me make my own decisions, doesn't really involve himself in my life. Progressive Christianity, it postulates that God is basically a father who is acting like a brother. Whatever you want to do, he'll let you do, and he'll help you do it. He's not going to raise you up. He's going to participate in your folly. And then feminism says, you know what? We'd be better off calling God mother because we don't like our father. Your view of God is likely a projection or a rejection of your earthly father. If your dad was a lion, you probably see God as a lion. If your dad was a lamb, you probably see God as a lamb. If, if your dad was a hypocrite, you'll probably see God as non-trustworthy and inconsistent. 
By forgiving your earthly father, you are removing the lens through which you are perceiving your heavenly father. For some of you, God is your father, but between you and your heavenly father is your earthly father, and everything you're looking at is through the lens of that relationship. My hope, prayer, and goal would be start with God the Father and then examine your earthly father. Don't start with your earthly father and make that the lens for your heavenly father. Now, part of the problem becomes this. There's very little teaching on God as Father. Okay, for those of you guys that are like a little more theological and nerdy, if you go to a Pentecostal or charismatic church, which member of the Trinity do they talk a lot about? The Holy Spirit, and if you're in a real Pentecostal church, it's the Holy Ghost, right? And the Holy Ghost is code word for happy hour because everybody goes crazy, okay? So <laughs> let's, say, let's, let's say that you're in a mainstream evangelical Baptist church, right, Baptist church. Which member of the Trinity you're gonna hear the most about? Jesus. There is no tradition in modern Christianity that emphasizes or focuses on the fatherhood of God. There are innumerable books written on the Holy Spirit. I wrote one. There's innumerable books written on Jesus. I've written a ton. I can't find many books written on God the Father. Some of you, the reason you love Jesus, this will be a prophetic insight is because you love the fact that the son is the hero. Because you're a son and your father's not your hero. So you like the story where the son is the hero. Um, I'm way off my notes. I just feel inclined to share this. Jesus says in John, I am the, John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, the life. What's the next line? No man comes to the Father but by me. The Holy Spirit brings you to Jesus. Jesus brings you to the Father. You are not fully experiencing the totality of salvation until you have made the journey from the Son to the Father. I believe that Jesus forgives you of sin and the Father heals you from the brokenness of sin. That's why there are many Christian men who are forgiven and broken. Because only the Father can heal. That's why it says again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The only religions that are talking about God as Father right now are Mormons and Muslims. Their view of God is not a biblical view of God, but they are growing because young men are looking for somewhere that talks about God as father. That's how strong the need is. And just hear me in this, global Islam is a father wound. It's a, it's a father wound because way back in Genesis, one guy slept with two women, had two kids, picked one the other, that kid's got a father wound and much of the Middle East comes from that kid declaring war on the other family. It's our whole geopolitical crisis is a father wound. So where do you go to learn about God as father? If you go to the Old Testament, it's very patriarchal and it talks a lot about fathers. Whole genealogies, this guy begat that guy, they're all patriarchal. I only found 15 times in the Old Testament that God was referred to as Father. Two thirds of the Bible is in the Old Testament, one third is in the New. In the two thirds of the Old, I only found 15 occasions where God is referred to as Father, and it's always over the nation of Israel, no individual. And then everything changes. Jesus had a favorite word for God. He used it 165 times in the four gospels. Do you know what that word for God is? Father. Jesus' favorite word for God was father. That word is Abba. It, it's not just the word that little children use, it's also the word that grown children use. 
So my, my son's 20, my daughter's 22. They call me dad, not daddy. That's more what Abba means, dad, father. When, again, off my notes, just feel inclined to share. Jesus taught us to pray how? Our father. What Jesus doesn't say is, focus on prayer. What he says is, get to know your dad. If you know that God is your father, you're gonna talk to him. If you don't talk to him, it's because you don't know him as your father. How many of you are dads with little kids? Any of you dads with little kids? Do your kids ask you for things? <laughs> right? yeah, they do, right? It's, you know, bedtime, they're like, can I have a Mountain Dew and fireworks? No, no, you can't, you can't. Oh, come on, dad, don't be legalistic, you know, be grace-based. So, um, <clears throat> if a kid knows that their father loves them, that he is for them, they ask him all kinds of things. They make questions and requests. You are grown men, but you're still the sons of God. If you understand that God is father, you're gonna be more likely to talk to him. Hey dad, had a rough day. Hey dad, you know, I married one of your daughters. Woo, what do I do with her? You know, like, what do I do? I feel like I married the devil's ex-wife. Dad, I need help, you know, so. Uh, probably shouldn't have said that, but nonetheless. <laughs> how many of you have a good dad, but even as a grown man, you still go get counsel from your dad or ask help from your dad? My dad was a general contractor building inspector. Before I buy a house, I call my dad. Hey dad, could you come look at the house? Sure. I, I still need my dad even though I'm a grown man. You're grown men, but you still need your dad. So let me hit some things quickly about Jesus. He is the son of God. This is not accidental language. God knows perhaps that it is harder to reach men than women. So he reveals himself as father and son to give us a healthy understanding of a masculine loving relationship, something that our culture does not understand. Jesus lived from the Father's identity. Luke 3, 22, a voice came from heaven. This is at the baptism of Jesus. Jesus goes down under the water, comes up. The whole Trinity is present. The Holy Spirit descends upon the Son of God in the form of a dove. God the Father says from heaven, what? This is my Son, in whom I am well. What had Jesus done? to that point, no. nothing. He hadn't preached a sermon. He hadn't cast out a demon. Uh, he hadn't performed a miracle. He hadn't done anything. Do you know that you work from the Father's approval, not for the Father's approval? That's if we understand how the Father parents us, that informs how we parent. I would never look at my kid and say, here's your job description. If you do a good job, I will then adopt you as my son and be pleased with you. Instead, when my son is born, he is my son and nothing can change that. And I am pleased with him even though he's not done anything. How many of you are gonna go home tonight and you're gonna hold a little boy with your last name who's your son and he didn't do anything today and you're pleased with him? But he just, he yelled, he puked, you know, filled his diaper and he's awesome, you know, and I love him, <laughs> right? But if the guy sitting next to you was doing that, you would not feel the same because he's not your son, okay? Jesus' identity was then attacked. If you know the Bible, in the next chapter, Satan comes to Jesus and he says, if you are the son of God. You need to know this, God calls you son and Satan wants to attack your identity. If you are the son of God, he's attacking the very words of God the Father over his son. And let me just say this, life and death are in the power of the tongue. 
The words that we speak either bring blessing or cursing over our wives and children. When the father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, blessing, honor goes over Jesus, not cursing and dishonor. Let me tell you this. If you want your kids to rise up and do better, see them where they will be when God's grace is done with them, not where they are, and then help them to do what the Bible says, live up to what they've already attained. Jesus reflected the Father's heart. Let me ask you a hard question. How many of you feel a lot more warmth toward Jesus than God the Father? A lot of guys I know, they're like, man, I love Jesus. What about the Father? I don't know. I don't, I don't really know much about him. John 14, 9. Whoever has seen me has seen what? Jesus Christ is the Father heart of God. See, what I hate is there's sort of bad teaching and a guy named Marcion historically that says, the God of the Old Testament, he's mean and angry and he's a father. And the God of the New Testament, he's Jesus, he's nice. Some people practically, it's like the father's the mean one, Jesus is the nice one and the spirit is the weird one. That's kind of how they see God. When you look at Jesus, you are seeing what Colossians calls the image of the invisible God. As a man, you were made to image an invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And what that is, that's a mirror, okay? When you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror and that mirror reflects your face. Every morning God wakes up and he looks at you and he expects you to be his mirror reflecting him to others, starting with your wife and children. Martin Luther says, if we wanna love our neighbor, we should start with our wife and child because they are our nearest neighbor. Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen what? Father. Say, so how do I know the father loves me? Well, he sent his son and like father, like son. So the question is not, in your home or family, are you being true to you, but are you imaging him? Are you letting your family see the heavenly father? When you forgive, when you give grace, when you love, when you're practicing the ministry of presence, the ministry of presence is simply being there. You are reflecting the image of the invisible God. You're mirroring God to your family and that will be life-giving to them. Sometimes as well, for you alphas, you lions, this literally means you need to change your level. I'm an old catcher. When my sons were little and I had to have a conversation with them, I knew that if I stood here, I would be talking down to them. If I came down here, I'd be talking with them. I'd look them in the eye, get down to their level. And I'd start with these questions. Uh, son, who am I? You're my dad. Yes, sir. Who are you? I'm your son. How do I feel about you? You love me, dad, and you want the best for me. I would ask my son then, before I talk to you about something hard, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that of every person on planet earth who is for you, that I'm first in line? And if my son said no, I didn't talk about what I wanted to talk about, I wanted to fix the relationship. Once the relationship is fixed, the ears open up and the heart opens up. I would then look at my sons and I would say, okay, I wanna to talk to you about this behavior. I love you, I enjoy you, this behavior is hindering my ability to enjoy you. So I'd like you to correct this behavior so that we could get back to having fun and making memories. Then I would tell my sons, literally, you have two choices. You, do what I, you don't do what I say and I'll spank you or you can just do what I say. So, so you're either gonna do what I say or I'm gonna spank you and then you're gonna do what I say. 
most of my sons went with the preferred option. They would say, oh, okay, I'll just change my behavior, dad. Okay, great. And then I'd pray over them and love them and kiss them and hug them. I had a few times with one of my sons, he'd look at me and be like, yeah, this one's gonna need a spanking. I'm like, really? <laughs> You're that kid. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be clear here. Let me say this. When Jesus came to earth, he got down on your level. He looked you in the eye. He humbled himself. And that is the father heart of God to come down and to be with you and to be present with you and to be invested and involved in your life. Last one. Jesus did the Father's work. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does also. What he's saying is this, Jesus' whole life was as the Son of God going to work with his dad. You need to see your life as going to work with your dad. When I was a little boy, my dad was a construction worker. My grandpa was a diesel mechanic. They both wore boots, jeans. Um, white t-shirts, they carried a thermos, a lunchbox, they had a hard hat. So as a little boy, I had steel-toed boots, I had jeans, white t-shirt, I, because you know what? I wanted to be like my dad. And there were times my dad would take me to the job site as a little boy. He'd be like, all right, Mark. He'd call me Marky, still does, I'm 48. My dad still calls me Marky. When he's at the church, he's like, Pastor Marky. So that's our thing. But anyways, love you, dad. And. Uh, he would give me nails to hammer and move this wood. And at the time as a little boy, I thought, it's a good thing I'm here, my dad needs a crew. Truth was, there are zero buildings constructed on planet Earth that I really contributed to as a child. Why did my dad bring me to work? So he could see what his dad does. And so that his son could do it with him. You need to start to see your whole life. The father doesn't need you. He's already working. He wants you to come with him so you can see what your father does and you can participate. Again, Jesus' words. The son can do nothing of his own power, but only sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does also. God's in your life. He's your father. God is good, he loves you. God forgives you. He's a grace-based dad. Not only does he call you son, but if you are in Christ, you are in the position of Christ. Galatians calls it the adoption is son, so does Romans. Here's what this means. You are his son, he is pleased with you. Some of you say, I have really blown it. Well, it's a good thing that he's pleased with you because now you can rise up to the blessing that he's already proclaimed over you. And let me say this, I'll close with a story. And here's, my, here's really my heart. I want you to know God as father. I believe it is the most transforming thing in a man's life. I'm a son, he's a father. My dad is for me, not against me. My, my, my father is tough for me, tender with me. My father will never leave me, never forsake me, never abuse me, never betray me. I have a perfect dad that heals my father wound. I can forgive my earthly father. Some of you, to have a healthy relationship with God the Father, you've got to, You've gotta forgive your earthly father. I got a text this morning. I won't share the photo for privacy's sake. It's somebody that I know, and I actually have great affection for. They didn't know where their dad lived, dead or alive. When they were a little kid, their dad ran off with another lady and disappeared. This guy since grew up, became a husband, became a father, now he's a pastor. He's getting ready to start a church. And he sent me a photo this morning. He said, I flew to LA, I found my dad. And I wanted to hug him, tell him I love him, and I forgive him before I open my church. So that he could be healed 
and the blessing of God could be on his future. I don't know what his father's response was, but he sent me a photo with him and his dad. I got that this morning. I'll close with one more story. Some of you lambs, you struggle with fear because you look at life and all of your male responsibilities and provision for your wife and kids. And, and sometimes as men, we feel that anxiety, like how in the heck can I carry this kind of burden and load? How can I pay all the bills and love these kids and keep up with my responsibilities and give my devotional time with God and love this woman and finish this race? How in the world am I gonna do this? And I'll, I'll give you a, one story. When my kids were little, we would take them all over the world with us on trips. And I told him, we're going to Scotland. It's one of our trips. And I, tell, I, I sold it. You're gonna see castles. We're gonna go to John Knox's house. You're gonna eat you know, biscuits and tea every day. It's gonna be amazing. You're gonna love this. And the kids are like, woo yay. Except for my youngest kid, Gideon. And he's like, I'm not going. <laughs> so I would up the sales pitch. Little buddy. It's gonna be amazing. You're gonna ride on a double-decker bus and a, you know, old school cab and maybe we'll even get to ride horses around the castle. And he got more defiant. I'm not going. Wasn't usually a defiant kid. One day, I literally got down. I looked him in the eye. I said, hey, little buddy, I, you need to go to Scotland. He was about, I don't know, maybe three or four. Maybe two, he was a little guy. He said, dad, I won't go. I said, little buddy, why won't you go? I said, if, if you don't go with me, how will I have fun? He looked at me and he said, oh, you're going? <laughs> I forgot to communicate that. <laughs> He's too thinking, I gotta have a, a connecting flight at Heathrow. I gotta find the hotel. I need to exchange the money. I'm out, I'm two. When you realize that you go through life with your father and not alone, it takes away the fear and it makes it all a great adventure. Your father is going with you. He's going with you to apologize to your wife. He's going with you to apologize to your kids. He's going with you to work. He's going with you. Your father loves you. He wants to do life with you. He wants to be present with you. You are his little buddy and with you, he is well pleased. Father God, I, I thank you that we get to call you father. And Lord, I pray for all these men. If any are not yet sons of God, would this be the time that they trust in Jesus, that they get a new heart that they get the Father heart of God, a heart that they can share with their wives and kids and others. And God, I pray for each of these men. In varying degrees, we've all got a father wound because all of our fathers were sinners. But God, could we forgive our fathers and be grateful for whatever it is they did for us, gave to us or deposited in us. And Father, I ask for the Holy Spirit to come, the spirit of revelation, and to help these men see moment by moment, day by day, incredibly practically, that you are a father, that they are a son, that every day is going to work with dad, that every day is an adventure with dad, but that dad has a plan and that dad knows the details. And as long as we stick close to our dad, we're gonna be just fine. I know that some of these men wanna be good husbands. They wanna be good fathers. First, may we all become good sons. In the name of the Son of God, amen.